Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to those of you who are joining. Thanks for hanging out. As always, there are technical glitches. It's the internet. But thank you all for hanging out. I don't think you will regret it. Welcome to the SANS Threat Analysis Rundown. My name is Katie Nichols, and this is a monthly webcast. If you haven't joined us, uh, often I will have a guest on that's not me, but this month you get all me the entire hour. And we're going to be talking about a topic that I hear a lot of confusion about throughout the community, um, group names, right? There's so many different names. How do we name things? How do we make sense of it? All of that. So we will be diving into that. And logistics out of the way first. Yes, this is being recorded. So if your friend didn't want to wait, you know, a few minutes till we got connected, this will be recorded. And yes, there will be a PDF of the slides. I know those are the important things. So let's dive right into our content today. If you're not familiar, again, as I said, this is a monthly webcast. And our goal is to bring you the inside scoop on what analysts in this community are talking about regarding threats. Some months, like last month, we had an awesome webinar from uh, Van and Aaron from Mandian talking about UNC 1878. Today, we're going to take a higher level approach, theoretical approach, thinking about how we track different threat groups. So lots of different topics. If you haven't already, check out. We have a, a YouTube playlist with all of our previous webcasts. Our agenda for today. First off, I'd like to do a quick rundown of some different threat news items that have been trending lately. Then we'll do a deep dive into our topic of the day on a group naming. And finally, we'll wrap up. I'll give you some action items, some homework, some things to go do and think about. Start off running down just a couple interesting items I've seen over the past couple weeks. Of course, it's the end of November, so we're kind of past the election. I consider that old news. But interestingly enough, I found that the news about election in the, the election in the United States was that there wasn't really a ton of news. So that was kind of a good thing from my perspective. Um, a report came out recently from Symantec on a group they call Cicada, which has significant overlaps with a group known as APT10. You'll notice I'm being very careful about my language, given that group naming is our topic for today. But this one is kind of interesting and worth a read, really good work from the folks at Symantec. And the interesting thing about this to me was that they found that this Cicada group, which overlaps with APT10, is still active as of a couple months ago. And that's relevant because there have been significant actions against the group known as APT10 by both the US government and the EU. And so it's worth watching this as part of that overall picture of thinking about how do actions deter adversaries or not. So that's one, one that's worth a read for sure. Of course, we can't you know, go by a month without talking about ransomware. But one thing I wanted to highlight that has really encouraged me is that I think folks are starting to realize that it's not necessarily the actual ransomware that we want to detect and are concerned about, it's the precursor activity, right? Cobalt Strike or those loaders like Z Loader and others that later deliver ransomware. So there's a really awesome article from uh, ZDNet that summarized the malware families that often lead to ransomware that you should watch out for. And so I think that's a great one for any threat analyst to look at and share with your defenders. If you see Z Loader, if you see TrickBot, action that because it could mean ransomware later. And my team did a blog post to that, uh, to that end as well. So the last one, definitely worth checking out a blog post from my friend Joe Slowick, who's now, now at Domain Tools. And this one was kind of neat because he started from a malware sample that they found on a multi-scanner site, cough, probably virus total, but started from a malware sample that they found based on just looking at current events. So we all know, you know, adversaries like to action current events. You might not be aware in terms of geopolitics that Armenia and Azerbaijan have been in a major conflict in 2020. And so Joe and his team kind of started with that hypothesis that maybe adversaries are using that current event, that conflict as a theme. And so a really cool example of how they pivoted from a malware sample really built out the infrastructure behind that. So that's uh, all of those stories are in the reference links, which that'll all be available in a PDF for you. So with that rundown, let's dive into group names. I love this topic. Anyone who knows me knows how passionate I am about this. And if you have questions or comments at any point, feel free to um, drop those into the Q&A panel. 
the end, I will get to as many of them as I possibly can. Um, if we don't get to any, you're welcome to reach out to me on Twitter or email or anything else as well. I realize I host this every month, but you might not really know too much about me. Um, so my day job is as the Director of Intelligence at Red Canary, which we do manage detection and response. And I think of my job there as bringing context about different threats to help detection and response. I'm also the um, work, I'm, uh, words are hard. I'm an instructor for a cyber threat intelligence course at SANS, Forensics 578. And so that's kind of my side hustle. And on days that aren't super rainy in the DC area, I enjoy working out outside. Um, pro tip, if it's too dark, I recommend putting up Christmas lights. You have an outdoor workout space. So I've been maintaining my sanity this year with uh, working out and then also baking. I eat a lot of chocolate. So that's a little bit about me. A lot of times you'll see the thank you in the credit slides at the end of a slide deck, but I wanted to kick off by giving credit where credit is due. Now, a lot of the topics I'm gonna to talk about, especially towards the beginning, others have said as well, others have had said similar things. And in particular, I wanted to call out Robert M. Lee and Florian Roth, who talked a lot about this topic of group naming. And I believe that so much of our work is derivative, so we really have to give credit to others. But what I've done is this is a topic I've mulled over for years and years through my experiences. I've looked at what Rob has said, what Florian has said, talked to analysts and thought about how I want to approach it myself. So thank you to Rob and Florian for their work. And I hope to kind of build on that and uh, add my own take. I hope this is useful to you. Let's start by talking about why we even name things. This is really interesting because, you know, for years and years, when I've been doing threat intel, just sort of named things, right? Just what we do, we name groups, but why do we even do that? This first point is really, really important you think about it by naming something doesn't matter what you name it you're transforming it from something unknown to something known and regardless of whether your known thing is just a cluster of activity whether you attribute it to a person or a country which attribution is a topic for another day but regardless of how you name things naming something is useful to us as intel analysts as defenders because then we can talk about hey we've seen persimmon partridge target us and here are their TTPs. And if we see this, we know that this is likely to happen, right? So it gives us a way to more easily communicate, to make something real and to communicate about how do we defend against something? How do we respond to it, right? If there's a cluster of something known, then we have a handle on it rather than just the unknown of all of the possible threats out there. There are lots of different ways to cluster groups and name groups. And this is a topic for another day, absolutely. But some common methods that I've seen, of course, the classic diamond model, Sergio, Andy, and Chris broke this down years and years ago. But this is a great place to start from. If you're trying to figure out how do we cluster together to make our own groups, of course, the idea behind the diamond model, any intrusion event has these four parts, the adversary, the victim, the infrastructure, and the capability. What you can do is if you start to track your intrusions by those aspects, you can start to cluster those different features together to form activity groups. So that's one approach. Many people in the community use that. I also love this diagram. This is from a FireEye blog post by an awesome analyst named Matt, talking a little bit about how FireEye uses machine learning to cluster together their groups. And as you might know, if you watched our webcast last month, FireEye starts with naming things un un uncategorized, right? They see a new you know, set of activity. They don't really know what it is. It's something new. They call it an unc. And then later, they'll elevate it to, for example, an APT or a fin group. The key here is that there are lots of different ways to cluster groups. I don't think there's only one right way. But a good place to start if you're trying to figure that out, look at what others have done. Look at the diamond model, for example. Maybe you say, like my team. We have a ton of endpoint visibility, and so we're going to be really heavy on the capability side. Maybe you choose to formally use the diamond model or another method. Maybe you decide to more casually cluster groups. Lots of ways to do it throughout the community. So with that background, let's talk through the situation that we find ourselves in. There's an intrusion. It happens. Yep. So we have an intrusion in our organization. That's the icon in the center there. That's our intrusion. 
And it just so happens that there's a uh, large company who creates operating systems who tracks intrusions and activity groups. And based on their massive collection on our operating system, on our victim, they say, okay, the intrusion that we've seen in our company, right, they do some pivoting and they find there are some TLS certificates that are related to that. There are some other alerts that they've seen. They do some infrastructure pivoting on domains. And they say, okay, well, the intrusion that we have in our company saw these other artifacts, these IOCs and TTPs, to call this dilithium. Cool. Well, it just so happens in our environment, we have a particular endpoint sensor, right? Endpoint telemetry, really, really useful for tracking intrusions. And so the company who owns our endpoint telemetry, right, they can see the telemetry from our intrusion. They do some other pivoting, right? They uh, find some other sources. They do some pivoting on domains and IPs. And then they have access to a particular forum where they can actually tie our intrusion to a specific persona. Interesting. So what they do is, well, they have some slightly different visibility into this, but it's still our intrusion. So they go, go ahead and cluster all of this together as a group that they call Fuzzy Bunny. All right, next one, right? So maybe there's a managed detection response company. You might be kind of picking up on the companies that I'm hinting at. This is all fictional, but for the uh, purposes of discussion, right? An MDR company who also has vis visibility into your intrusion and, right, found that same domain infrastructure. But then in some other customers, they find some other malware and some other command lines that look very similar to this original intrusion. And so they decide, let's cluster all of this under a group named Scarlet Seagull because it's different slightly different than what the others have found. Kind of see where I'm going. All right, so we come in, right? Our team is in purple and right, we have access to our own intrusion. We talk to this blue company here and they share this domain with us. And then we do some pivoting ourselves into other intrusions. We find there's another intrusion that looks really similar to this one. And we find some other similar command line. And so, we see this as sort of a cluster of activity, but what the heck do we name this? This is a situation we find ourselves in. Different teams have different visibility, right? I don't know exactly what your team's tracking and that makes sense, right? It's hard enough to coordinate amongst our own teams. We can't know everything others know. And there are really good reasons to not publish everything publicly. Our adversaries read blogs too, and so we don't want to burn all of the infrastructure, all of that. And, you know, sometimes things are customer sensitive, right? We all have customers or in our own internal organizations. So we might not want to share everything. But what that results in is that sometimes there are pieces of information that each team has that others might not see. We have different visibility. This is the challenge we find ourselves in. And We'll talk much more about this, but a lot of people like to say, well, for example, okay, dilithium is an alias for Fuzzy Bunny, is an alias for Scarlet Seagull. But as you can see, they're not exact overlaps. Sure, there's an intrusion in the center in our company that all of these different companies have different visibility into, but the way they track these clusters is slightly different. And so this is key to understanding the rest of this presentation. Right. When we say that group names are the same as, generally we don't really mean that. We mean that there are significant overlaps, sometimes more or less significant, but keep this in mind. And this is why this is so incredibly confusing. Let's make it a little more complex, right? So different visibility. So I said there are different ways to cluster things as well, right? Maybe one team uses activity groups with the diamond model. Another team has their own methodology, which is totally fine. And so that makes it a little more complex, right? They can't say it's a one-for-one -one overlap if you have different vis visibility and different methodology. Another challenge, these groups constantly change, right? There are humans behind the keyboard of these different clusters or groups. And what happens if a developer goes from one place to another, switches teams, then maybe one group looks like another group because that developer moved jobs. So they constantly change. The other challenge, so I showed on the last slide, right? These different group names that are totally made up, they overlap a little bit, 
but some group names overlap more than others. So let's take you know, a set of command line malware infrastructure and right, one team calls it Vibranium. They publish a public blog post and another team publishes a public blog post on a group called Angry Donkey. And they include the same IOCs, the same TTPs in there. And so from a public perspective, I might say, yeah, Vibranium is the same as Angry Donkey, right? They publish public blog posts, it looks the same. Is it really the same? No, because we don't know what else there is. We don't know what else these teams are tracking that they might not have made public for very good reasons. So this adds to the challenge because what I've seen is some groups are very highly overlapped, some maybe overlap a little bit less, makes it even tougher to track. So here's the bad news. If you came to this webinar and you were hoping that I would tell you, you know, let's all just agree on a single name, that doesn't make sense, right? It's not a good analytical decision for anyone to say, let's all use the same name because we all track things a little bit differently. We have different visibility and different methodology. And so that means that the other bad news is we're gonna have a lot of, a lot of names and it's gonna get confusing. Sorry, not sorry. The good news is though, we can do a better job at tracking those overlaps as a community and as analysts. And as we start to do that, right, track how does this overlap with this, we're gonna produce better analysis because we know exactly what we're talking about. We'll dive into that more. Talk about what the community's done so far with this group name challenge. All right, so we talked about how you know everyone might have different visibility and different methodologies. So everyone has created their own names. Great, we see something and you know we identify a cluster of activity using a diamond model or whatever methodology and makes sense. We maintain analytical control by naming it ourselves. So let's do that. But then everyone is incredibly confused because we have 11 billion names. That's a scientific fact. 11 billion is the approximate number of names that we have for different groups. All right, so let's do something like create a Rosetta Stone. And this is one from Florian Roth. This is an open uh, public spreadsheet that has a bunch of different groups, um, group names and operation and campaign names. And this is something that I have definitely tried to do on teams in the past. Right, so you start out and you say, okay, look at Russian groups. Sophacy, someone says that that's the same as or very similar to APT28, is similar to Pondstorm, Fancy Bear, etc. And there are references in this, but the challenge with this is it doesn't tell us exactly how they overlap. Right, so what I've, what I've done in the past when I've done an attempt to make a Rosetta Stone is I'll have like a comments column. And for example, I'll say, all right, well, energetic bear kind of overlaps with dragonfly, except in these like a few circumstances with this intrusion, and then berserk bear and then energetic bear are sort of two subclusters, but then this group tracks them as crouching yeti. And what I find is that columns, that comments column just becomes like an essay of how there's a lot of overlap. And so I would say that these Rosetta stones, it's a place to start. And you know, a lot of credit to Florian and the folks who maintain this. I find it as, hey, maybe there's an overlap, right? I look at this and maybe I know I should look to see if the Dukes and APT29 overlap somehow from different companies. But over time, my experience has been that Rosetta Stones don't work because as we've talked about, these are not exact overlaps, right? So the fact that, for example, there's a Berserk Bear and an Energetic Bear, which are names used by CrowdStrike, they use the bear names, those are on the same row that tells me that there's something more complex going on. All right, so is that a stones? Maybe it's like a partial solution, but let's try something different. Let's try sourcing the overlaps, All right? And this is an excerpt from the MITRE ATT&CK groups page, the group page for Dragonfly. I was previously on the MITRE ATT&CK team. You might see the uh, MITRE ATT&CK flag in my background. And the team does a great job of saying, great, so Dragonfly, this is a group identified by Symantec, another company. And then here are associated names, right? Names that best they can tell, because it's not easy to figure out, have some kind of overlap at some level. And they cite it back to the source, which this is a great thing to do, source your information as we'll talk about. So 
great, maybe you look at this and you see, okay, well, I wanna know why is Dragonfly overlapping with TG4192? And so you go to the source and much respect, I love the analysts at SecureWorks, but this is what a lot of us do. And I've done this in my past too, right? It's sort of generic, the Iron Liberty Group, also known as these other names. And so if I'm trying to figure out what is that actual overlap, I'm kind of left in a tough spot because there isn't that level of detail. And to be fair, this is something that we've all produced for ourselves. And I've done this as well, much respect to the SecureWorks team. It's just the challenge that we have of having these different names. Okay, so we've tried creating our own names. That made a kind of a mess of different names and a Rosetta Stone and tracking overlaps that kind of didn't work. So let's try using someone else's name, right? So, you know, we don't want to create another name. This is fair. We don't want to make it tougher for everyone in the community to have another name to track. So great, let's just use someone else's group name. Challenge there is we inherit what I call their analytical baggage. We might not know exactly how they're tracking that group. And so that has a lot of challenges because if we don't know how they're tracking it, how can we figure out what we're seeing and if that overlaps with what they're seeing and how they track this group. So it can get kind of tricky. And of course, you know, if you use someone else's name and you're wrong because you're trying to do the best you can, people at Twitter on Twitter will probably yell at you. And that's not a lot of fun either. So by using someone else's name, you might think you're doing everyone a favor, right? One less name to track. But if you didn't name that group, you don't know exactly how it's defined. And so that's a challenging approach as well. All right, so we tried uh, everyone creating their own names. It doesn't really work, cool. And we've tried uh, using other people's names too, and that, that doesn't really work either. And so uh, I've probably been at this point, like if you just want to rage quit and table flip and um, you know be completely filled with rage over group names, that's okay. I've been there too. Angry rage panda. But here is where I'm gonna say something a little crazy. I think there's a way that we can do this. What I found in talking to individual analysts is that the analysts who track these groups really closely often know the overlaps. If you say, you know, how does Fuzzy Duck overlap with APT1337, and the analyst who tracks them every day often knows, hey, there's this malware family that overlaps, then these other indicators, or this other intrusion don't overlap. And so the fact that analysts who track these groups every day can figure out that overlap makes me think that the rest of us can do it too and that there is some hope. So I'm generally an optimist. I try very much. That's, that's my, my uh, call to action. So let's talk about some ideas, how I think we as a community could do this a little bit better. First off, if it makes sense to, Yes, use other people's names. Just be clear about what you're defining them as. So for example, a company comes out with a public blog post on a group called Dilithium. You, you look in your organization, right? There's that, those indicators in a public blog post. You look in your organization and you find that TLS certificate and that exact command line exactly matches what is in that public blog post from Dilithium. Just call the dang thing dilithium, right? This is where I think that sometimes we get a little um, ahead of ourselves. If you are literally just pivoting on something that someone has already named and nothing else is added to it, my suggestion is call it that name, but track why you call it that name, right? Okay, so we're calling this dilithium. We saw this internally, this command line, this TLS cert, and we also saw it in the public blog post. It's a very simple level. And a lot of threat intel teams, as you're getting started, that might be where you start. That's my recommendation. But sometimes you're gonna to need to branch off. And I saw we had a question, can organizations change the name of groups? Absolutely, and sometimes it might make sense to do that. So take our example before, right? Our organization, we just saw the TLS cert and command line based on that public blog post, so we called that dilithium. But over time, this happens very, very often, maybe we see a slightly different command line that we think is related and a slightly different intrusion that wasn't in that public blog post. 
So at that point, my recommendation is branch off. It's okay to change your group name. So maybe you call it Mando, but you track the fact there's overlap here with what another team has called dilithium, right? So sort of a nuanced thing, but if there's an exact overlap, you're literally just taking information from someone else, nothing else, call it the same thing. But when you start to add on, right? This often happens over time. You bring in additional intrusions, additional information. When you start to sway, right? You start to move away from how it's initially defined, you can name it your own thing. The other recommendation I have is, as you find activity that you think overlaps with this, go talk to the team who named Dilithium. Researchers in this community are, as a whole, super awesome. And so oftentimes, right, you can find them on Twitter or LinkedIn, or a lot of times they'll have a contact me thing on their website or an email address in the blog post. Reach out to them. And this is how we get better as a community, because maybe that team didn't have visibility on what you're seeing. And whether you know you change your name or not, or they can incorporate what you found, at least tell them, hey, we think there's some other stuff that's related. Have you seen that? If they haven't, cool. Give it your own name, but just track the fact that it overlaps with what someone else has called dilithium. Another situation, sometimes we will just find something that seems newish. Um, my, my teammate Tony found this a couple months ago, started to notice this weird crypto mining activity and same wallet address that was being used and reached out to analysts in the community and said, hey, is anyone else seeing this? And no one we talked to had. Doesn't mean that no one was tracking it, but cool. So we said, well, let's cluster it together and we'll call it Blue Mockingbird. In this example, right? Same thing. All right, we saw a few different intrusions in our environment and we pivoted in virus total, other places, any run. We found some other malware. We found another domain. We did a whole bunch of open source searches, right? Maybe if we have a commercial Intel feed, maybe we looked in there, no, nothing we found. And so this seems new. Great, let's give it our own name. Let's call it Grogu. You can probably see my TV habits for those of you who are caught up. All right, so a, a new group that we named makes sense. But it's never easy, right? So sometimes what will happen is, right, another company comes out, maybe you're tracking Grogu internally. Someone else comes out and they put out a public blog post, right? This red section here, public post, and only part of what you've been tracking overlaps. That's tough, right? And this is where I think there's a lot of confusion over names again, because sometimes people will just be tracking groups separately. They don't know the other team was tracking them. And so they'll both come out with blog posts sometimes around the same time, some kind of public reporting, and people will say, well, why'd you give it a different name? Well, we didn't know someone else had named it. And so if that happens, track the overlaps. Again, your team has some other intrusions you're tracking as Grogu, but there's a blog post that's out there publicly. Cool, explain what overlaps with that blog post on persimmon partridge or whatever group. So again, the idea here is sometimes, especially as you're a more advanced team, you start to cluster act together activity, you might find something that seems new. No one else seems to be tracking. In those cases, absolutely give it your own name. But then if you find out later there's overlap, explain that overlap, right? And if you publish publicly, right, explain that overlap as well. So maybe that makes sense theoretically, but you're kind of like, this seems hard. I don't know how to do this in a real way. Here are some examples. The big one and the big ask I have for all of you is when you're putting out public reporting, explain overlaps to anyone else's public reporting that you know about. Of course, you're not going to know about everything. But if you do know about it and you can explain the overlaps, please, please do it because it will help us all understand how people are tracking these different groups. Here's an example of a big blog post, right? Persimmon Partridge, a new group. And so, right, this team comes out with this new group name, but they've found that it overlaps with what someone else is calling Gro Grogu. So explain that, right? Our new group that we're naming, Persimmon Partridge, overlaps with Grogu. You could even give credit to the team that named that other group and link to their research as well. Always a good practice. 
here's how those two things overlap, right? Maybe there's a malware sample. Maybe there's a domain name. You're saying, okay, these two different groups, here are the overlaps between them. But then you can also explain, hey, there's some stuff that we're tracking as persimmon partridge that there's no public reporting on this being that other group named Grogu. So, right, maybe there's some encoded PowerShell or a certain domain name that we haven't seen overlap. And so that helps our readers and our analysts who are reading this understand, well, okay, that's why they're tracking this as a separate group, right? It's not an exact overlap. There's a partial overlap, as you've explained, but then there's some other stuff they're tracking. So that's my big ask. And I, I've seen quite a few folks do this already, right? That you'll explain, you know, maybe you just say there's another name or malware family that overlaps, but if we can improve the level of detail whenever it's possible, it won't always be possible, but improve the level of detail in terms of how we explain those overlaps. That's my first big ask for everyone in this community, including myself and my team. The next piece of this that is so, so important is to source everything. And you know, my team will probably give me a hard time. This, this is kind of a pain, right? If you source, where did you get this IP? Where did you get this IOC, this TTP? Is it from an internal intrusion? Is it from a feed? Is it from someone on Twitter? But tracking how you know what you know is absolutely essential to doing good analysis and to trying to track these group overlaps. The important thing when you're sourcing is source at the most granular level possible, right? If you know the specific command line string was from your internal intrusion or from a blog post, source it to that rather than just, hey, we know this group name, that's a good start. This group name's from this blog post, but if you can get to that granular level of detail, those IOCs and TTPs, that's gonna help you out quite a bit. As much as you can, include your original context as well. You know, if you're using a threat intelligence platform or you know, even just an internal SharePoint or a shared drive of documents, right? If you have the information behind that IOC that you're tracking, and you know it's a certain group, include the report so that you can go back to it as you need to. The last point, it's okay if you track things under more than one group name. Because as we've talked about, right, there are overlaps. And so it's perfectly fine and actually good if you say this IP address is tracked as fancy bear by this team, and the same IP address is tracked as Sophacy by this other team. Totally fine to track things under more than one group name because then you know exactly which names different teams have assigned to it. How do you actually do this in action? Well, if you're not familiar, MISP is a really awesome open source threat intelligence platform, very widely used across the community. And so MISP is great because it lets you see overlaps very easily. So let's say, for example, you're using MISP in your team and you entered some indicators, some TTPs from your latest Grogu intrusion. In MISP, the different events will actually show you at the top of a new event that you create what are related events. And so in MISP, you could really clearly see, okay, this intrusion by this Grogu group that we retrack overlaps on two different attributes with this other blog post on persimmon partridge. So that tells us right off, hey, there's some overlaps here. As I mentioned, you wanna source everything at the most granular level of detail though. So for example, these are different attributes in MISP. There's an overall event, that intrusion, and then we track attributes, so like the not real hash value of some malware, the domain name, right? A certain password that's used, maybe an attachment, a malicious attachment name. And so this is our Grogu intrusion. And so all four of these, we're gonna use the tags feature in MISP to say, yep, these are all Grogu. But we know that these two indicators have also been tracked as persimmon partridge. And so we'll go ahead and tag them with that as well. Perfectly fine to tag these with different group names because then you know our team refers to it as Grogu. Someone else refers to it as persimmon partridge, but it also lets you keep this separation of, right, okay, we also have these additional indicators and TTPs that we're also tracking. Point out another feature in MISP. So, okay, cool, we have our 
domain track to those two groups, well, we want to know the source of that, right? The tags help us see that in a nice, simple visual. But if you look in MISP, they track related events as well. So this tells us, hey, this event for our Grogu intrusion overlaps with this persimmon partridge blog post based on this blue macaroon domain. Again, what we're doing here is making sure that as we're tracking these TTPs and IOCs, we're tracking them back to the source, right? Do we know it from our internal intrusion? You could add in you know, ticketing information, a ticket number, and or do we know it from someone else's report? This is the absolute key to trying to track all of these overlaps, in my opinion, is sourcing everything using the original name, what did that person who named it define it as? And tracking those overlaps, realizing it's not a one-to-one -one overlap, but there is a lot of partial overlaps with these group names. In terms of sharing those overlaps, if you can, share them publicly, right? But as I mentioned, you know, there's good reasons not to share everything publicly. Our adversaries are watching, maybe it's sensitive information. So if you can't do that, at the very least, Track this internally for your own team. This is where I see some analysts already doing this. Awesome. Let's have more of us do this so that if you are tracking overlap between these two groups, what you can then do is if you have that internally, maybe you meet someone from another team is tracking similar activity, right? You can share that overlap with them. Even if you can't share it publicly, maybe you can share it with trusted people in the community. And I think that will also go quite a long way to helping us make a little more sense of all these different group names. My other ask, as we all try to navigate these group names together, respect the originators of the name, right? The people who named that group, they define it, full stop. And if you're ever not sure, as I said, a lot of researchers are really open, reach out to them. And if you think something might be related, say, hey, is this related? If they say, no, we don't track that as this group name, respect that because the person who clusters that activity based on their methodology and visibility and gives it a name, it's their name. And if you use it, respect that, track the overlaps and be explicit about why you're using that name if you use it. I've seen a lot of kind of finger pointing, especially around the reuse of names. So my ask for the community, is please just more, less of this, right? Less of the uh, angry cat hissing pointing lady and more of, hey, let's talk about this, right? You track this as this group name. I track this as this group name. Oh, it's because you have different visibility. Great point, right? Big community group hug. But really, I think that pointing at each other and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong about this. It's not gonna get us anywhere. If people are wrong, right? You think they're wrong? Call them out, like explain respectfully why you disagree and that's fine, we can and should disagree. But less name calling and less yelling at people because they're trying to do the right thing, right? This group name thing is not easy. So please, let's, uh, let's try to empathize a little bit more with the challenges that we each have. At this point you're probably like, well, that sounds really hard. Like tracking everything down to that granular level, whew, that seems like a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Doing this kind of work isn't easy. Tracking adversaries like this is not easy. And so what I would say is aim for progress, not perfection, right? In yourself, in your teams, and in this community. I have no delusions that everyone is not going to watch this webinar and say, yep, tomorrow let's all do a better job explaining overlaps. But what if little by little we can start to chip away? We can start to share a little bit more, even if it's among trusted partners, right? People that we trust in this community. Here's how we're overlapping these group names. Let's aim for progress and not perfection. And ultimately doing this, it's good for you. Doing this granular level of analysis, really understanding why do we define things under a certain name? Why do other people define things as that name? Where are the overlaps? It's really good for you as an analyst. It's good for our analysis, right? Making it sharper, making it uh, more high confidence. And it's good for the community because maybe there's gonna be yes, less yelling and hissing and pointing and more collaborating. Lastly, I wanna end on a note of hope. 
I mentioned that there are already examples of people who are doing this, right? This was a great one. FireEye put out a blog post on Fin11. And they say it includes a subset of activity that other researchers call TA505. And look, they link to the other researchers' work. Excellent. But they explain that they don't attribute them the same way. So please don't use those names interchangeably, right? Awesome. Calling out others, explaining that we track things a little bit differently. So there is definitely hope. And someone, uh, I wonder if Matt's watching, poor Matt. So Matt tweeted, you know, when I called this out on Twitter, he said, well, you know, there's a lot of conflation of Evil Corp and TA505, and Microsoft has been tracking them as overlap. And right, like I've said to all of you, TA505 is a proof point name. Let's defer to proof point on how they describe that. Check this out. Someone from proof point, they said, they greatly appreciate the nuanced analysis provided by FireEye. Look at that, two different companies, right? Saying we appreciate the analysis of the other. And so there is hope, right? Many people in the community are already kind of scratching the surface of this, giving credit to others, explaining the overlap, but I think we all can do this. So in closing, as we've talked about, group names are not one-to-one -one overlaps. It's not an easy, clean fit, I went through, of course, you know, years ago, I thought they were. And then as I started maintaining that Rosetta Stone, I realized it is not easy one-to-one -one overlap, kind of frustrating, but that's okay. Doing this type of analysis is not easy and we can do this. The bad news is we can't agree on a single name, but the good news is that we can do a better job of tracking those overlaps, right? Internally in our teams, with our trusted partners and across the entire community. And that's gonna make us all better as analysts and better at tracking adversaries because that is the whole goal of what we do. And with that, I see we have a couple different questions coming in. So if you have questions, we have a couple minutes. I will take as many of them as I can. All right, so saw one coming in from David a while ago when I was talking about the FireEye names. Yeah, FireEye slash Mandiant uh, uses temp as well. Um, if anyone from Mandiant FireEye is on the um, chat, they can clarify. I think that temp is sort of an in-between, but that's not my naming methodology. So I'm going to take my own advice and say that you should definitely ask someone from FireEye and Mandiant. All right. So uh, David also commenting, love to see if there was a standardized way that vendors could uh, qualify and quantify the overlap between actors. Has there been work to do that? Um, where should people go? I have never seen formal work. If someone's aware of it, please, please reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn or somewhere. Um, I haven't seen formal efforts to try to track the overlaps um, other than kind of how threat intelligence platforms are inherently set up. But I think that would be a really cool area for further research and further work. And again, maybe someone's doing that, but I'm not aware. So if you're aware of any kind of effort to qualify and quantify the overlaps, please, please let me know. Let's see, so someone uh, commenting, the real problem is that even though we categorize groups differently based on different collection, we need to link them to a known group to know what country comes from or who the person is behind it. We really need to find the overlap and link it even if the link is not strong. Uh, interesting, so bringing in the attribution discussion. Um, so the attribution discussion is pretty tough, but let me uh, give you an example. Um, so my team, Red Canary, we have a lot of endpoint visibility. We don't do actor tracking in forums like some other companies do. And so a lot of times what we will find and what we will cluster on is we see these TTPs. They all look really similar. And then we might say that, for example, maybe our TTPs overlap with a group that someone else has looked at and they attribute it to a country, but we're just looking at endpoint telemetry. And so we can't validate that attribution back to a country. So I think it depends on your requirements, of course, separate discussion on the need for attribution or not, but for my team, we really focus very tactically and operationally, right? What is this cluster of stuff so we can figure out how to detect and respond? Other teams might have really good use cases to track it to a country. And so my recommendation, again, would just be to define, right? If my team defines a group, we're saying it overlaps with what someone else attributes to Russia, but we're not saying that we attribute it to Russia. Really important point. Um, question on, are there any comprehensive public databases to show all the IOCs associated with a certain threat actor? Ooh, great example or great question. 
Um, short answer, no. I am not, not aware of any database that has everything. Um, I know of folks, I think Sergio is actually a Sergio, the a diamond model guy, did this years ago where he tried to look at overlaps between all the different threat feeds that are available and found very little overlap. And so there are a lot of databases out there with IOCs, but I don't think we will ever have a single database with all of the IOCs. Um, I don't think that's possible. Um, yeah, so a great example. Oh, you brought up my favorite group name, Lazarus Group. This is sort of the uh, bane of my existence a little bit. So Lazarus Group is sort of the umbrella term for anything North Korea related. And the overlaps are with groups like Hidden Crow Cobra, APT38, Blue Neuroff. Um, yeah, so the challenge there is, again, yeah, this umbrella term. Another umbrella term that I'm not a fan of is WinNTI. So my recommendation, as always, right, source it. So if someone comes out with a blog post and they call it Lazarus Group, great, you identify that as Lazarus Group. Maybe internally, your team is tracking these cluster of Blue Neuroff. And if you have those same IOCs or TTPs tracked internally as Blue Neuroff, you can pretty easily see, right, that IOC that someone else called Lazarus Group, we refer to it as Blue Neuroff. So that is, that is a huge challenge. And that's another one that I've found, again, if you talk to analysts who track Lazarus Group and North Korean actors every day, a lot of times they can tell you sometimes off the top of their heads, hey, this activity is actually, you know, what FireEye calls APT38. So very interesting, uh, interesting challenge there with the umbrella of Lazarus Group. Am I going to share the slides somewhere? Of course, um, the PDF of the slides is gonna be available from the page that you joined the webcast from. So we'll get those up as soon as we possibly can. Another good question. If you ever had disagreements um, within an organization or other organizations regarding naming threat groups? My team, our most common disagreement, full disclosure, is about which bird name to use, because um, we use bird names. So sometimes we'll argue, like, should it be a warbler or should it be a robin? Um, but seriously, there are a lot of disagreements about this. Um, I didn't put any uh, public ones, but if you see them on Twitter, you'll, you'll see them quite a bit around the concept that I talked about of um, when an analyst will use someone else's name, another company's name for activity. Like maybe there's a company who's named something APT1337 and out of trying to not create another name for this community to track, I'll call it APT1337 in my blog post, and then people will disagree saying, hey, that's not really APT1337, for example. So there are very commonly disagreements among analysts in this community, and that's what, you know, many of those are very respectful. Some of them are a bit rude, a little bit nasty, and so my you know, ask for the community is, when you see those, reach out to the people and talk to them, right? If you disagree with how they're defining a group, maybe someone uses your group name, and it doesn't seem quite right. If you have the time and the energy, reach out, start a conversation. Because the other benefit of doing that is maybe initially you disagree and you don't like how they're using your name or they're naming something, but chances are that they might be seeing similar activity to you. So if you reach out, you might actually get some sweet new collection from talking to them. So lots of disagreements. Excellent question. All right. Any other questions? Anything you're curious about? Excellent. Well, if you do have other questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at like the coins. Um, and yes, this is being recorded. So we'll post the YouTube later if you want to digest this again. And we will post the PDF of the slides as well. I'm also a big PDF fan. So I'm going to leave you with a couple action items, right? First off, go think about this. It's a lot. It's a fire hose of information and maybe new concepts you haven't thought about. Go think about it and go talk to your team. Right? How do we name groups? How do we think about groups? And think about, is there any way that within what you do already, right? if you write public blog posts, could you start calling out the overlaps a little bit? If you use a tip, could you start you know, sourcing things better? Think about if there's any way in your existing workflows that you could try to do a little bit better in terms of tracking group name overlap. The other action I have for you and request is, let's all be a little more careful about how we talk about group names. Let's try to move towards the hey, this group name overlaps with or is associated with rather than exact alias for, because my concern is by calling them aliases, it just confuses us all a little bit more. And people who aren't familiar with this community, 
the details of this analysis, in particular journalists who I love, but they have a tough time coming into this community. And so by watching our language, right, watching how we talk about these group names, we'll do ourselves and this entire community a great deal of service by being a little more careful. And as promised, a bunch of links, right, ransomware precursors, I'd recommend checking out this great article from CDNet. If you see any of those malware families, tell your defenders to remediate quickly. I also recommend Zloader is one that we've seen pop up that we think leads to ransomware. Great people on Twitter. Um, check out the hashtag for Zloader, a lot of people who share. And that Cicada group that has overlaps with APT10 and uh, Joe Slowick's blog post on pivoting. So there are some references for you to check out later. As I said, those PDF uh, slides will be posted and you can, uh, you can check out a link to this uh, webcast, share it with folks from that same page that you joined from. With that, that's all I've got. Thank you all so much for being patient with technical issues at the beginning of the broadcast. Please reach out if you have questions or comments and we hope to see you at a future webcast. Take care.